forward to hearing from God's uh, word this evening. God speaking to each one of our hearts. And as I mentioned in the message last night, when I uh, first got on the platform, as Cornelius said, uh, when Peter was coming to the house with his servants, he said, we're here to hear what God has to say through you. And it's not the servant. That's not the critical part. It's the words, the scriptures. And the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It does indeed speak to the matters of the heart. So for each personality in this audience here this evening, as well as those that are online, and if this is recorded and put out somewhere else, uh, this message is for you. And the idea is to make sure that we apply it. We apply the scriptures to uh, each one of our own hearts. Uh, it was mentioned about Know the Word Ministries. Yes, we did start that back uh, in the 90s and 1990s. And uh, we have resources on that website, knowtheword.com, that website that we maintain. But we also have resources right here below. So if you are here for the first time this evening, you're welcome to use uh, as many as you can use of these gospel tracts, these ministry tracts for believers as well as for unsaved that you can pass along. To those that may need them, I always like the Cities of Refuge. That's a good gospel track. There's a number of others as well, plus a general uh, brochure on the ministry of Know the Word and all the different uh, resources that we do provide the Lord's people. So you can help yourself uh, between meetings or afterwards as well. Now, as you see on the screen behind me, our portion will be Numbers chapter 11, and verses one through nine. So please turn in your Bibles to that portion. Numbers chapter 11 and verses 1 through 9. Last night we looked at a portion in Zechariah chapter 3. We saw that uh, Joshua, the high priest at that time, Zechariah's day, wanted to perhaps to move forward and have access into the presence of God, but Satan was resisting him. Uh, whether a person doesn't know the Lord or whether they do know the Lord, there may be that desire to move ahead in the things of God. For the unsaved, they have to understand it's not our works of righteousness, which we have done, but by God's mercy and grace, he saved us. So there's a need to trust Christ as Savior. And then we can have access into the very presence of God, through the throne room of God. It says in Romans chapter 5 that we have access. We rejoice in this access. We don't have to rely on a human intermediary to gain us access into the prayer room of God, so to speak. We have that wonderful privilege because of Christ and our standing with him. As believers, uh, maybe there's cleansing that, that's needed in order for us to be used of the Lord. That was the challenge with that portion in Zechariah chapter 3. Now, Numbers chapter 11 this evening, we have a similar principle of moving forward. The question is, are we moving forward? And so let's take a look at that with that in mind as we read the text here, Numbers chapter 11, verse 1. Now, when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, for the Lord heard it and his anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts or outermost parts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched. So he called the name of the place Tabera because the fire of the Lord had burned among them. Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. And now our whole being is dried up, and there is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. Now the manna was like the coriander seed, and its color like the color of delium. The people went about, gathered it, ground it in millstones, beat it in the mortar, cooked it in pans, made cakes of it, and its taste was like the taste of pastry prepared with oil. And when the dew fell on the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. And so these are really solemn words here that we have in God's word, but it's an experience of the nation of Israel as they went through the wilderness. You remember the accounts? Okay, come up. <laughs> you remember the account of the Israelites when they, there we go, uh, that when they uh, were on their way to Egypt, or rather on their way to uh, the wilderness and Canaan from Egypt, and God said, I'm going to bring you to a land flowing with milk and honey. He said that in Exodus chapter 3 and 8. It was a very wonderful promise that God gave to his people. He was going to bring them to that land. But they first had to go through the wilderness, and God had some important lessons for them to learn as they went through the wilderness. And so uh, some of those lessons were to obviously reinforce the idea of dependence upon the Lord, faith in him. 
We see this great verse here in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 17, a verse that reminds us that we need to make sure that we're not, we didn't buy into the world. Love not the world, the scripture says. John tells us that. He said, don't love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Uh, there are enemies in the Christian life. We know that. We looked at one last night. Satan is an enemy. That's part of the trinity of evil. That's against us. That's opposed to us. Satan's name actually means adversary. And so he opposes. He resists. He does all he can do to get us off track and to keep us from moving ahead in the things of the Lord. But there's more than just one enemy, isn't there? There is also the world. That's what we see here in this portion in John chapter, 1 John chapter 2. The world also keeps us from moving ahead of things that are in the world. Now, there are different aspects of the world that we see in Scripture. There's the world of people. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That's a good thing. The world of people. And that's for whom Christ died, people. There's the created world, the mountains and the oceans and the scenes that we see. That's a good thing as well. Uh, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, we read in the scriptures. But there's also the world from the standpoint, it's the evil system under the sway of the wicked one, based on greed and ambition, uh, based on trying to get ahead and uh, doing anything you can do. It doesn't matter. No rules apply, that sort of thing. That's the world system. And that's the world that we're warned about here in 1 John chapter 2. That world system that is based on things contrary to the word of God, not the world of people, not the created world, but the world system. And so one of those reasons why we may not be moving forward and progressing in our walk with Christ is because we might have bought into the world. That's what this portion that we have before us here in Numbers chapter 11 reminds us about. And knowing that there'll be young people here, wonderful singing, thank you for your singing, young people, and thank you for being here in the a meeting that you had this afternoon to address some matters with young people. And so I know there are young people in the audience, but this applies to every one of us. Because no matter how old you are in the Lord, you're still a child of the Lord, you know him. And the world still can have its grasp and can still have its influence in your life, whether you're young or old. Brother Boyd Nicholson, I remember hearing him in ministry down in Jersey when he would come and <clears throat> speak at various uh, conferences down in Jersey. And uh, I remember him saying, you know, one thing I worry about is being ambushed at the end of the line, right? A wonderful life of ministry and service for the Lord, 40, 50 years, 60 years, some people who've served the Lord that long. And at the last thing, and that's what people remember most, what happened at the very end, right? They forget about the 40 years or 50 years of faithful service. Sometimes, you know, just one incident, people can remember that for a long time afterwards. And so that was always his worry. Well, he finished well, and a lot of servants have finished well by the grace of God. And we pray that all of us would finish well. Remember what Paul said when the Ephesian elders were there in Acts chapter 20, he said that I may, notice it says, that I may run and finish my course with joy, may. He wasn't presumptuous. He realized he had to depend upon the Lord. So he said, may finish the course with joy. When he's in the prison in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, I have finished my course. I have run the race. And so he could attest uh, to the faithfulness of God because of those things. And so we need to depend on the Lord every step of the way, day by day, moment by moment, I kept in his love. Moment by moment, I have life from above, looking to Jesus till glory doth shine. Moment by moment, O Lord, I am thine. And we need to rely on the Lord all the time, every day, every moment. We need to make sure that we're dependent upon him. But if we get our eyes off the Lord and we're trusting in our own strength or we're distracted by the things of the world, then it's easy to get off track and we need to make sure that we get back on track. And this portion here in Numbers chapter 11, what I would call part of the sins in the wilderness, what Israel was guilty of, this one right here, complaining and carnality, is a reminder, especially for young people, that uh, you are being bombarded by the things of the world through the phone, television, movies, whatever it might be. And laced in those uh, entertainment vehicles are contrary concepts to the word of God oftentimes. And so it needs to, re requires us to and make sure that we need to be discerning. I love that verse in Jeremiah, it says, we take the precious from the vile. There is some stuff that's good. I mean, I like watching the Waltons from years ago. I was in a restaurant that had the you know, TV these days. 
TV, I'm in a meeting in the food, and there's a big movie playing while I'm eating my meal. You know, everything's surrounded by movies and, and television. Watching the Waltons. I don't know if you folks remember the Waltons. You might be saying, who watched, you watch TV? <laughs> I don't know about that, but the idea is there's some good, wholesome programs, but you also have to be careful. And that's a reminder here for us in Numbers chapter 11. So let's look at some of these details. And we need to be reminded of the example of the scripture. We'll talk about them in, as well. <laughs> but uh, in the opening verse right here, in verse uh, one, we see it says, the people complained that displeased the Lord. Remember, complaining displeases the Lord, right? Remember that. Uh, one of the things that we need to be reminded of is uh, sometimes we can be uh, have a foot in the world and a foot in the things of God and, and think that we're going to be pleased with that. And one of the illustrations, illustrations that really stands out to me, I first heard it uh, preached by Billy Graham years ago. This verse in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, you remember the scene, it was Elijah on the top of Mount Carmel. We've been there in our trips to Israel. Tremendous scene. Just think about it. He was there all by himself, by himself. In front of 850, not 450, but 850 false prophets, 450 and 400 of uh, false prophets of Baal and Asherah. And he said to the people that were there, this is God's people. He looked right at him and he said, how long hold you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. And the sad thing is it says the people answered him not a word. Talk about being conflicted. They were like saying, hmm, you got a good point there, Elijah. What should we do? Follow God or follow Baal? As if they had to think it through. And so they were conflicted. They had a foot in both worlds. And so that's the thing that we want to make sure that believers are not having a foot in both worlds. I mean, yes, we have, we're in this world, but not of it, Paul tells the Corinthians. And so that's what we need to be reminded of as well. So there is a symptom here. And in verses one through three, my estimation, what we see is here the symptom of the problem. What is the symptom of the problem? There's complaining going. Okay, it says right here, when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. The Lord hears everything. For the Lord heard it and his anger was aroused. Now he had been good and kind to them. That's the goodness of God. He had been kind to them all the way through. He brought them first off out of Egypt, redeemed them out of Egypt brought them through the Red Sea, wonderful demonstration of his power and, and grace working on their behalf, and then brings them into the wilderness to test them to see what was in their heart. That's what we're told in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and again in chapter 8. To test them, to see whether or not they would keep his commandments or not. God sends us through trials, the if need be, in 1 Peter chapter 1, sends us through trials to help bring to the surface the things that haven't really been yielded over to the Lord. And that's how God works. That's how it works in the school of God. He applies the pressure just the way he needs to apply it in your life and in mine. For everyone, it's different. And it helps us to identify what the problem is in our experience. Some people call them uh, blind spots. And the reason why we don't see them is because they're blind spots. Makes a lot of sense. And so God helps us to see what those things are. Sometimes he brings somebody into our life or across our path that helps us to see our blind spots that others may not say something about, but others uh, can help that bring that out in us or help us to see our need. And so there's a symptom here, and the symptom is complaining. Why were they complaining? Well, it says here, first off, the fire of the Lord burned among them, consumed some in the outermost or the outskirts of the camp. And the people cried out to Moses, and when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched. Thankful for the intercessory prayer of Moses on behalf of the people. Hebrews chapter 11 tells us that uh, quenched some heroes of the faith quenched the fire of violence. That's Moses here being referred to from this passage. What is the symptom of the problem? Well, the symptom of the problem is complaining. And uh, that's a reminder to us that when we complain, it's often because we have a focus on ourselves. And I know, realize this basic, simple uh, teaching right here. But just think about it. How often do we complain? I would say we complain quite often. We don't realize how much we complain, but we complain. We complain about everything. The weather, we complain about this, we complain about that, the food, whatever it might be. And we complain. But that's symptomatic. 
And to be really convicting is uh, the verse in Psalm 106, verse 25, it tells us that they complained in their tents. I've heard the old expression, right? Roast preacher. You know, that's when you take the pre after the dinner that you have at home, then you roast the preacher. I hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> but, you know, the idea is that uh, there can be complaining and complaining in tents. We, for some reason, we realize when things are good in our experience, we say, oh, Lord, thank you for watching me. But then we can go complain privately as if he's not there. And certainly he is. And so we don't want to be guilty of complaining in our tents. That's a good verse to keep in mind. Psalm 106, verse 25. Rather than when we complain and saying, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, I'm through with this or I don't like that. We take our issues to the Lord. So what Psalm 61, verse 2 said. From the end of the earth, David says, what will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed? What do you do? Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. That's a great verse. Maybe some of you young people are not familiar with that verse. That's a great verse. Lead me to the rock that is higher than me. Psalm 41, Psalm 40, 41, all those verses in there. The Lord establishes our going. Put our feet upon the rock and establishes our going. He is the rock. And Deuteronomy tells the same thing. Our rock is not is their rock. Our enemies also being judges themselves. Our rock, Christ, is the rock. He's the solid rock. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. That's a great verse. And how about this verse too? Psalm 77, <laughs> verse 31. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Now that's a verse that's in, uh, in reverse, I would call. What's the result of complaining? It's not that you vent, ventilate, and you get it off your chest and you know it's out. It makes you feel worse. That's what David says, right? I remembered God and was troubled. I complained, and then my spirit was overwhelmed. We're talking practical Christian living right here. I mean, we can talk about the doctrines of the faith, and it's wonderful to do that, but also where the rubber meets the road, we might say. This is important. This has an effect upon how we uh, work for the Lord and how we are effective and fruit-bearing for Christ. And so complaining here, the complaining of the nation of Israel here in Numbers chapter 11 is just one of those sins of the wilderness. In Numbers <laughs> chapter 13 and 14, it's unbelief. In Numbers chapter 12 with uh, Miriam and Aaron, uh, Miriam and Aaron were both murmuring against the leadership. In Numbers chapter 16 is the rebellion of Korah. You look at 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 against the priests of their leadership. All those things are part of the sins in the wilderness. And it behooves us to study the word of God carefully and jump in there and say, am I just like the Israelites? That I complain about this, I complain about that, I murmur here, I don't like this, I don't like that. God judged the nation of Israel. And we look at the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapters 10, it tells us all these things are written that we, through the example of the scripture, that we might be admonished by these things. God is saying on a practical, horizontal plane, we need to do some self-inventory to make sure that we are doing those things that would be pleasing in his sight. And so the first thing that we see here is the symptom of the problem, the complaining. That's the symptom. That's the outward manifestation of something going on in the heart, keeping us from moving forward and experiencing the blessings of the Lord and our walk with him. And so there's a symptom here. That's not the cause. This is just the outward show of something going on deeper in the life. And so uh, it does affect a lot of things. It affects a lot of people. And so the next thing that we see from this portion is this, is the scope of the problem, right? Rather, the source of the problem. So I went, went ahead here. Sorry, I think I, my slide went out of place here. Uh, maybe it did. Well, pay no attention to that screen right there for a minute, okay? <laughs> It's the scope of the problem, okay? The scope of the problem. And the scope of the problem is that it affected everybody. Notice again what it says here in uh, verse 1. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. So this complaining was contagious and it spread. But it also says it consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. 
Now, why did it consume some of the outskirts of the camp and not some of the inner part of the camp? Maybe the source of the congregational complaining, the intensity of it was from the fringes. You get the picture? Uh, perhaps God was judging the outskirts of the camp because that was really, in a sense, where the source of the complaining was coming from. The highest level of the complaint, not those that were in the middle or involved or at the center of things, but rather the fringe. That's what it seems to imply right now. That's why the word of God is so powerful, and so wonderful. We need to study it, uh, look at the word, and ask the Lord for help and guidance, direction in the study of the scriptures. And so uh, the people cried out. They understood the problem, what was going on, so they cried out. They cried out to Moses. They should have cried to the Lord, but Moses they cried out to. This is the human condition. We have a tendency either to blame people that we see, say you're the reason for the fault. That's what Mar Miriam did in the next chapter, chapter 12. You look at it on her, they're blaming Moses for the problem. That was Korah's problem, Numbers chapter 16, blaming people. But instead, they really should have called out to the Lord. But regardless, Moses showed to be the type of leader he truly was. That's why in Numbers 12, God says to Miriam, this man, Moses, is my servant. I speak to him face to face, not like others. He's a true leader. So Moses then took this complaint that the congregation was bringing and heaping to him, upon him, and he turned it over and made it a prayer request to the Lord. That's what should be done. It reminds us again of spiritual leadership and spiritual maturity. Rather than striking back, Moses calls out to the Lord, and he does pray, and it says the fire was quenched. The source of the problem was coming. The scope of the problem was wide. The source of the problem was from those perhaps on the uttermost parts of the camp and even beyond, because it doesn't finish there, does it? If you were carefully listening and watching the words here, look at what verse 4 tells us. Here's the source of the problem, the true source. So there's layers here. The people are complaining. Wow, it's a problem with the people. Well, maybe it's more than that. Maybe it was a problem with the French. Well, maybe it was more than that. Maybe it was some other issues, factors going on. And that's what we have to peel back these layers and see what's going on. And so in verse 4, we're told, Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving, so the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? Wait a second. Who are these mixed multitude being referred to here? We're talking about the children of Israel and Moses, but now we hear this other group called the mixed multitude. So now you look like it's time to turn in your Bible, turn your Bible and the pages of your Bible to Exodus chapter 12. So turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 12. And where do we see the reference to the mixed multitude? Who were these mixed multitude that were traveling with the Israelites? Well, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 37 tells us that when the children of Israel departed from Egypt, they had another group come along with them. Verse 37, the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 men on foot besides children. A mixed multitude went up with them also, and flocks and herds, a great deal of livestock went with them. So who were these people called the mixed multitude? They weren't Israelites, the mixed multitude. I mean, a whole group going through the wilderness, you could say, was a mixed multitude, but they're identified as a separate group in Numbers chapter 11. Some can look at various verses in the book of Ezekiel and some others and identify perhaps they were Egyptians that had married Israelites while they were still in Egypt, and they're coming out with the Israelites. Regardless, it doesn't seem like they are the people of God, like the nation of Israel. Okay, so now I'm looking at young people. This is great. We used to have a lot of young people when we were in our assembly, but we don't have as many now. So it's great to see you guys here. I mean, I love it. You know, I still think I'm like 17 in my head. <laughs> but I feel that. <laughs> so I feel like I'm preaching to the fellow youth group people here, right? But this is a reminder to us who you keep company with can really drag you down. 
right? Who you keep company with. This seems to be the source of the problem here. Remember, God wanted to bring his people through the wilderness, and uh, he was blessing them all along the way. So all they did was complain, complain, complain. And God met them at their complaint. Exodus chapter 16, the, another chapter, they complained there. They had problems with no water. They were drying up. And so God uh, had Moses strike the rock, and the water came out of the rock. Then they prayed for the, that was 17, chapter 16. They did the manna. They were hungry, and so they called out. God answered their prayer for manna. So they complained, and God, in his grace and in his goodness, despite the way we are, despite the fact that we're not really living up to the standard that we should be living up to. He still blesses us. Isn't that a wonderful thing with the Lord? How good he is. How gracious is he, is he every step of the way to us. And so this mixed multitude came out with the Israelites and they attached themselves to them. Why? Maybe it was a marriage. Maybe we don't know. We're just conjecturing here. It's just a guess. Maybe they were impressed by the way God worked on their behalf. They saw these manifestations of God's power and goodness. And they were attracted to that when they came out. I mean, even in youth group circles, college and career, we had college and career for years in our home. 12 years we had college and career. We went right from the teens to the college and career beyond that. All sorts of people, all sorts of reasons why people who don't know the Lord might attach themselves to a local fellowship without trusting Christ as their Savior. Meaning there can be unsaved people. Why is that? Oh, I like that girl in the youth group or I like that guy in the youth group. And they come out, but they haven't turned their lives over to Christ. It's great to have them come out, but they want to hear the message. And so they need to hear the message. And this mixed multitude attached themselves to the Israelites and accompanied them in the wilderness. But in the course of time, that wrong relationship brought the people of God down. So you have friends in high school, you have friends in college, grade school, wherever it may be. And if you attach to yourself or they attach to you for whatever reason, a friendship, they can easily bring you down. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Evil company corrupts good morals. Sounds like a Chinese uh, proverb. It's not. It's in the word of God. Evil company corrupts good morals. And it's easy for us to be brought down. That's what happened here. And that's the source of the problem, it seems. Worldly attachments. And they can come in all sorts of ways. We saw how the adversary, he's more... He's just, you know, he's like the serpent, right? Slithering, and you can't detect because it's so it's deceptive. But the world has its ways too. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. Colossians chapter three. And so here are the children of Israel affected by the mixed multitude. Uh, the ones that were among them, it says in verse four, uh, yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept and said, who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic, but now our whole being is dried up and there's nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. This is the account of them despising the manna. One of the sins in the wilderness. They say, we, all we have before us is this manna before us. But oh, we remember the good old days, the garlic, and the, or I don't know how to make it like garlic or that, but garlic and onions and all these spicy things, these leeks, these melons, all these great things we had in Egypt. Were they that way when they were in Egypt? It says in Exodus chapter one, they cried out to the Lord and the Lord heard them in their grief. They didn't want to be in Egypt that way. That was Pharaoh's diet to keep them attached to the land of Egypt. You know, warfare has a lot of different levels. And the Pharaoh, not only did he have them chained, so there's some uh, in bitter bondage because of using them as a workforce, a national workforce, but he also fed them the diet of Egypt. And that, is, that, that kept them close to that. And so the world too. 
and have an influence on us by the diet that it offers the world system. And if Christians buy into that and feed off of that, they're going to be addicted to that as well. So when times get tough, it's all of a sudden, oh boy, we remember the good old days when we had the leeks and the onions and the garlic and everything else. Now, I didn't come to know the Lord until I was 17. I was brought up in a denominational church. We heard the stories. I could tell you about Samson and uh, Delilah. I could tell you about David and Goliath. I could tell you all the stories in the Bible, but I did not know the Lord. The gospel was not preached. The stories in the Bible are moral stories. It gives some nice lessons about how to live nicely and stuff like that, but it was not the gospel. The gospel was not there. Maybe it was there and I didn't know it. I was blind to it, maybe, but I didn't hear the gospel when I was a young person, 9, 10, 12 years old. And so then our family got away from church until we were invited to come back to a New Testament assembly, just like this meeting right here. And the gospel was clearly pro proclaimed. You couldn't walk out of that building without knowing about you need to trust Christ as your Savior. Praise the Lord for that. The simplicity that is in Christ. Great to have the stories about Samson and uh, Delilah and about David and Goliath and all these things. And the great, you know, pick your stone and, you know, get the Goliath giant and all this sort of, that's all great. That's a perhaps a practical lesson. There's a spiritual application there as well. Deeper application. But the point is, the gospel, as from my standpoint, was not presented. But when I heard the gospel, I trusted Christ as Savior. I found out the way of life. It's wonderful. But you know, after you live the Christian life, what you were raised on, I was 17. You know, the Beatles were a 60s group, and I was too young then to understand what's going on, but I heard them and listened to them at albums in my house from the Beatles and David Bowie and the Eagles. And I know you're probably saying, what? But it's the case. So I came to that meeting and trusted Christ and then began to grow in the Lord. I still had the problems with the language. I still had problems with this thing and that thing. But after I continually heard the message of the word of God, I knew I had to make a break with the world. Praise the Lord, no praise to me or anything like that. But one day I said to myself, you know, I need to take this growth step in the Lord. I need to move ahead. No one came to me and said, you know, you got to get rid of some of the music that's in your, your stash of albums. They have LP albums, no CDs, no cassette tapes. They weren't there. Okay. So I had this huge stack of vinyl CDs. Right now, they're probably worth millions, I'm sure. But I had all the classic, you know, vinyl albums, all that. It was a whole day in the winter. And I says, I got to throw these things out. They're holding me back from moving ahead in the Lord. So I took my big, huge stack of LP albums. I walked outside and I put them in the garbage can and I brought the garbage out because the garbage truck was going to come the next day. And so I'm looking at the garbage can and all these albums in it, which would play perfectly. And I says, you know what's going to happen? The garbage men are going to pull up and they're going to take those albums and they're going to have them for, and I don't want to spread the thing that I'm trying to get rid of. And the book of Acts, they used they had an incident where they had a bonfire and threw all their things from the magical arts. And I, well, I wasn't going to have a fire and get in trouble with the fire chief, I'm sure at that. So what I did, it was a cold day, right? So I took every one of those vinyl albums out and I played frisbee against the backyard fence. <laughs> Had a fun time doing it. Target practice, you know, throw it this way, throw it this way, throw it back way, and against the fence as they splinter across the ground. As they hit that fence, cold day, they're already frozen. And all those things were destroyed. It took me three months to finally clean up all the shards and find them. I remember the following spring, my mom sent me out to do some work, and there were, there were still these vinyl shards sitting in the dirt from that incident that I had. But I can tell you this. When I did that, there was a huge, huge growth step in my life as a believer. Because those albums contained a lot of stuff that are definitely con were definitely contrary to the Word of God. 
And that made a big difference in my life, that break. The reminder to us, we need to be moving forward. And yes, Satan is there to resist us, as we looked at last night, Zechariah chapter 3. But there's other enemies, too. There's the world. There's the flesh within me that craves it. Remember when Noah had those birds, two birds, the raven and the dove? The raven pictures our old nature. The raven likes to feed on the dead things of this world. And when that raven went out, it fed on the dead things of the world. The dove is a clean bird in Scripture, and it only feeds on clean things. And it reminds us that the believer has two natures. Someone said it this way, two natures struggle within my breast. The one is foul, the other blessed. The one I feed, the other I uh, hate. But the one, I, the one I love, the other I hate, the one I feed will dominate. And if we feed the flesh, we're going to have the results of that. And so here, the scope and source of the problem, huge problem across a lot of God's people right here, the source of the problem is this mixed multitude that got down to the heart of these people. Well, let's take a look at some of these things. And that's the mixed multitude of all these verses that are found there. You know, there's two verses I want to bring out, too, from a congregational standpoint. In Jude chapter 4 and then Galatians chapter 2 and verse 4, remember Jude only has one chapter to it, so it's just... The verse, certain men have crept in unnoticed. They crept in. False teachers who long ago were marked out for his own condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness or lasciviousness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They creep in. False teachers can creep in. But in Galatians chapter 2, verse 4, there are false teachers that are brought in. That's what it says. This occurred because of the brethren who uh, secretly brought in came in by uh, stealth, spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. So false teachers can come in two ways. They can creep in, come in through the side window, so to speak, or they can be brought in, come through the front doors. And it's that way with worldly thinking. It creeps in. Sometimes it comes straight on. And so we need to remind ourselves of those very valuable lessons from the word of God. Well, there is a sequel to all this. And what's the sequel to this? Well, look at, again, going back here in Numbers chapter 11. Look at what it says. Their attitude was, now our whole being is dried up. And by the way, keep your finger right around Exodus again, because we're going back to Exodus in just a minute, Exodus 16. But uh, it says, now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before eyes. They're despising the manna. Now, the manna was like coriander seed, and it's color like the color of delium. Now, why is that description given to us in the scripture, verse 7, God almost uh, highlights, devotes a whole verse to it, just to describe what the manna was like. Why, why is that so important? The description of the manna. It says in verse 8, the people went about, gathered it, ground it in millstones, beat it in a mortar, cooked it in pans, made cakes of it. Its taste was like the taste of pastry prepared with oil. Sounds good to me. Pastry. That sounds good. Pastries prepared with oil. Sounds great. That's it. Until you compare something. Now, this is what it says in verse 7. The manna was like coriander seed. Its color was like the color of dare. dare uh, it says the people went about, gathered it, ground it in those stones, beat it in the mortar, cooked it, pans, made cakes of it. Did all this effort to try to dress up the manna. Did it work? Uh, they lost their taste for the manna. They wanted to go back and taste the exciting, spicy things of Egypt. Well, again, keep your finger here in Numbers chapter 11. Go back to Exodus. This time, look at chapter 16. In chapter 16, God provided manna. This is where the manna came from. And remember, God's faithfulness provided that manna for 40 years through the wilderness. God was faithful. Despite all their complaining, he was still faithful to them and provided that manna to them. And so the whole incident of the manna being provided is found here in Exodus chapter 16. But interestingly, look with me at verse 30. God then goes on to describe the manna as it came to the children of Israel, its first uh, arrival, so to speak, to the nation. So the people rested on the seventh day after they complained. God provided it for them. They gathered, some gathered a little, some gathered much, uh, earlier verses. 
the house of Israel called its name manna, and it was like it was like white coriander seed, same description, and it was the taste was of it was like wafers made with honey. So when it first came, they said, Oh, this is great. They first said, What is this? What is it? That's what manna means. And when they ate it, it was delicious. It was like wafers made with honey. It was white. The color delium is what del that's what delium means. And they just enjoyed it. It was like wafers made with honey. And they were thrilled with it. So going back now to Numbers chapter 11, after that mixed multitude had its influence upon the nation of Israel, now they start saying, all we have before us is this manual. That's not the way it was supplied when, uh, when their answer was when it was first supplied. They had lost their taste for the manna. And they tried it, they did all their efforts to try to dress it up. And the end result of it, this is the sequel, the end result of it, it tasted like pastry and oil. I get the picture, it's like vegetable oil, soaked in vegetable oil, blah, not like honey. They despised the manna because they lost their taste for the manna. The manna was God's food for the nation of Israel. This is God's food for God's people right here. And I can remember when I first was a believer, all of a sudden opening up the word of God and saying, this is wonderful. Oh, this wonderful promise from God's word, this wonderful word. You know, that should be our attitude all the time. But if we allow other people, other influences, the world to come in and affect our thinking, affect our spiritual appetite, it won't be long before this gets put to the side and we start saying, oh, I remember those Beatle albums. Oh, I remember those songs, all that in the past. We can despise the men because we've allowed other things to come in. And then we ask ourselves a question, how come I'm not moving forward in the things of the Lord? How come I'm not feeling the presence and the power of the Lord in my life? There's a good answer for that. It's found right here in Numbers chapter 11 and other scriptures as well. And so there is a sequel to this whole thing. There's a great verse to keep in mind. Again, it was uh, the pastries made with fresh oil. Compare with that verse in Exodus 16, 31, if you're taking notes. But you know, there's a great word found for us in Psalm 19, verse 10. First part of that Psalm is the world of God. The second part of that Psalm is the word of God. And the word of God is tremendous. Let me read you those words. No need to turn to it, but this is what it says. Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Nothing can convert the soul like the word of God. No educational book will ever do. It's the word of God. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. That's what the word of God does, it rejoices our heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean. Up to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. It's enduring forever, it says. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Wafers made with honey, fresh oil. Which would you rather have? The Israelites had that. What they needed to do <laughs> is break away from the influence of the world. And that's what Christians need as well, to break from the influence of the world. The world's all around us. Everywhere you turn, it's there. But you have to have a heart that's desirous to follow the world. Let me give you this final illustration. Remember in Genesis chapter 19, when Lot was in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, had taken a seat of authority there, sat at the gate, it says. And Abraham and the destroying angels came in to warn Lot to get out of the city. Abraham was there. Lot's wife, remember the instruction that was given to Lot's wife? Don't look back on the cities of the plain or you would become what? 
a pillar of salt. Her heart was back there. And she looked back there and she became a pillar of salt. It says. Now the next set of verses, it says, Abram looked back on the cities. He looked back, but his heart wasn't there. He didn't turn into a pillar of salt. He didn't turn into a pillar of salt. He looked back because his heart wasn't there. Hers was. That's the thing. We got the world all around us. It's there. You can't do away with it right now. It will be done in the future. The Lord will take care of that. But where is our heart? My son, my daughter, give me thine heart. The word of God tells us. And so Numbers chapter 11 reminds us of the dangers of worldliness and everything associated with it. We trust the Lord will speak to your heart about these things as well. Let's pray. Our Father, our God, thank you again for your precious word that does indeed speak to the matters of the heart. We pray, Father, for each listening home, private decisions that need to be made, commitments made to walk the separated life. Lord, only you can do that in our hearts. Be hard and strong as preaching can be. Lord, it's your spirit that makes the difference. And so we pray indeed that uh, you will speak to hearts even tonight. We ask these things, giving thanks in our Savior's wonderful and precious name. Amen. Amen.